Welcome to Castamancy, the only podcast that already knows that yes, you did leave the oven on. Coming up on this episode, the runes, the ancient oracle of the north. We'll learn if we are living before or after Ragnarok, if giants are real or not, and how you can repel elven attacks. As always, we'll be answering your listener questions, but only if you behave yourselves. Otherwise, we're turning this universe around and going back to the void. So ponder your orb and swing your pendulums. It's time for Castamancy. Okay, everybody, welcome to the show. It should be a little quieter today. Shouldn't have as much background noise. <laughs> So that'll be nice for a change, except for me bumping my own stuff around. Today's episode is the runes. So what are the runes? I think um, probably you've come across the runes. They're very, very popular these days in a lot of uh, fiction. They're in, people discuss them in many fantasy books and TV shows. And the Vikings in general and Nordic things are quite popular now in, in uh entertainment so you've probably seen the runes whether you know it or not um there are old letters they're basically an old alphabet um but they obviously have more meaning than that and we're going to get into that uh so let's start at the start let's start with the history of the runes and we'll start with the cool part of the history we're going to start with the mythology the mythological version of how the runes were discovered and given to humanity so again many of you have probably already heard of this guy he was a god his name was odin and he's uh, quite well known today um, i think probably most people know him from comic books which kind of irks me personally but there you have it so uh, odin the the high god the all-father of the norse pantheon he was the one who was credited with the discovery or acquisition of the runes and basically what he did was uh, he wanted he wanted them because he, he's relentless in his search for knowledge and information and uh, magic and power basically uh, he, he really will stop at nothing and this story gives you an example of how far he's willing to go to get things like this so he wanted the he wanted the runes the runes were kept in the well of Erd which is where the world tree the tree with all the things on it grows from so it's the source of all things effectively is where the runes are submerged and he sacrificed himself to himself which is pretty pretty wild concept <laughs> he he uh he basically stabbed himself with his spear in his chest which almost fatally wounding himself and then hung himself some people say by the neck some people say by the leg probably by the leg but i don't know because people were sacrificed to odin and they were hung by the neck and stabbed so we're not sure but uh anyways odin he really roughed himself up and then hung himself from the world tree over the well of erd and he hung there for nine nights and nine days and refused all help and aid until basically the runes came to him or i guess he would have died if they hadn't because he was all in at that point so he stood there he saw the runes in the water he scooped them up and then he had the powers of the runes so i will read to you i do it's a short it's a short uh, part of the poem um, that details this event so here we go it says i know that i hung on the wind blasted tree all nights of nine pierced by my spear and given to odin myself sacrificed to myself on that pole of which no oh excuse me how's that for a good reading of which none know where its roots run no aid i received not even a sip from the horn peering down i took up the runes screaming i grasped them and then i fell back from there so not an easy job to get a hold of the runes but odin or somebody associated with odin was nice enough to share them with humanity so that's the mythological version that's the cool version now let's get into the more mundane version uh, as far as we know, the earliest inscriptions of runic writing was in the year 150. So they're probably, they were probably around a little bit before that, but the first known inscriptions were year 150. Um, there were, over time, many variations, many runic alphabets, many innovations. Some of them grew the alphabet to more letters. 
Some of them shrunk it down to as little as, I believe, 16 runes. Uh, so they kept changing. They would add new characters. They would take away. So they have not been consistent over time. The one that we will be focusing on for this episode is the Elder Futhark, because that is the one that most people use for divinatory purposes. Of course, there are others um, that people do use, but uh, I don't think they're quite as widely used. So we'll be focusing on the Elder Futhark. Um, and the, where did they come from originally? They were probably from old Italic alphabets. So it's just the alphabets around the Mediterranean that were developed and adapted by the Germanic tribes that were in contact with the Mediterranean people at the time. Um, another theory I've seen is that Phoenician sailors uh, had gone basically up and around Europe and made direct contact with Northerners, uh, Nordic people, and uh, shared the alphabet with them. Or at least, you know, they saw the Phoenicians writing things and were like, oh, that's great. How do we do that? Let's borrow their letters. And if you look at the runes um, and then compare them to the old Italic alphabets, specifically Etruscan and Phoenician, you can see that there really is uh, something going on. There's there's a shared uh, style, a shared heritage there. So that's probably where they came from. They probably came from the Middle East or the Mediterranean, and then uh, they came up to the north. Or Odin found them, and we have everything wrong. Who knows? Uh, what were they used for originally? Mostly they were, there was just an alphabet. They were really used for writing. Um, but then of course the cool stuff, uh, at least in the North and the Nordic countries, they would use them for spells. Uh, there was the idea where if you were able to write something, it would become a reality of some sort. You could, um, create something called a bind rune and we'll get into this in a minute, but each rune has a meaning. And so if you put the runes together in a certain way, you can combine meanings into a kind of sigil or, or a symbol that represents the forces you want to invoke. So that's a bind rune. And of course, divination. And they really did use these for divinations a long time ago. And I say they, but I'm speaking broadly about Germanic tribes. I think it was Tacitus, a uh, Roman historian, who documented the uh, use of it. I believe he witnessed it himself and uh and the process therein so uh the runes weren't used for really long though they had a fairly short run it was from or, as we said before year 150 to about the year 1400 uh, and that was it so and then everybody switched over to the boring latin alphabet which apparently as far as i know the letters have no meaning and i have looked they just are what they are so it's really boring it's not exciting it's definitely not as uh, magical as the, the runic alphabets were. Uh, so, but I, they weren't totally out of use. There were still some, some uh, a trickle of usage up until the 20th century. They were still used for decorative purposes. So people would put them on their house or, or make a thing. And you have to be careful because a lot of research, a lot of scholarly people will say, oh, it's just art. It's just a motif, but in reality, I think folk practitioners were still probably using them for magical purposes, as it so happens. You can't have magic in academia. They don't like it, even though maybe the people do, but uh, I'm digressing. So they still use them for a little bit. Uh, divination with runes really probably fell out of popular use for a long time. And I think it wasn't until 1982 that they really started to pick up again. I'm basing this on the popularity of a book. Uh, it was by Ralph Blum or Bloom, uh, the Book of Runes by Ralph H. Blum or Bloom. Uh, so he uh, he published this book. It was it took off. It was published over and over and over. And I think probably a little bit before the book, there was some buildup as there usually is. Um, but really, this was the restart of runic divination, um, and it's. It's gotten quite popular today, I would say, and there are some researchers who have gone really deep into the topic, but that's what I'm using as the flashpoint, is around 1982. And in this book, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to tell you, there's something that bothers me to no end. He he, he included, the, there's 24 runes in the Elder Futhark, and he included a 25th rune, a blank rune. A mysterious rune that's not a letter or a character or anything. It's nothing. 
It's nothing at all. It's the silliest idea I have ever come across in this kind of thing. Um, I've heard I've heard rumors that the 25th rune was included because the publisher wanted it in there for packaging reasons. It would be 24 runes wouldn't quite fit in the packaging they wanted, and to make it nice and even, um, they wanted it something else. So they added another blank rune, and he had to write a bunch of crap about how its meaning is, oh, it's a question mark. It's the ask again later of the rune set. It's ridiculous. It's silly. And some people use it, but they're wrong. So don't be one of those people. Uh, and so there were there were other people before Ralph Bloom. Um, there were smaller groups, and they were mainly in Europe, probably mostly around Germany and Nordic countries. Um, you can look. There's other rune sets. There was one in 1910, I think. Uh, Guido von List, a guy in Germany, said that he he had he had a problem with his eyes. He was blind for a while, and he said that he saw a new set of runes emerge from the inner darkness of his visionary state. Make of that what you will. That that's the story. So that's enough about the history. Let's get into the brief structure. What are these things? What's going on specifically with the Elder Futhark? Why are they called the Futhark? First of all, they're called the Futhark because that's just like the first couple of letters. Um, you can see with the older Latin alphabets, they're called abecedariums because it's A B C D, you know, so on. So the alphabet A B, right? So Futhark is. Uh, F U F A R K, Futhark. Those are the first letters. So that's why it's called that. So the Elder Futhark uh, has 24 runes, or 24 letters. They are divided into three sets of eight. They have Freya's eight, Hagal's eight, and Tears eight. And that may or may not be right. I know there's some controversy around whose eight is what, but uh, that's what I have in my notes here. So deal with it. Names and meanings. So let's go over these. Um, I'm going to list the name of the rune and then talk a little bit about what it means really quick. So Fehu is livestock, but it's mobile livestock. So it's things like wealth and abundance and uh, liquid assets. Uh, Urus is a bull. It meant Orok. It was symbolizing an old bull that doesn't live in Europe anymore because I think everybody ate it. Uh, it means strength, tenacity, untamed potential. So it's like an un it's like a wild animal. It's like a wild power. Thurisaz, uh, it means a thorn, so it represents uh, defensive things, conflicts, uh, sometimes regeneration, um, but it also has associations with uh, frost giants, so it's kind of a kind of a dangerous uh, pointy rune. Ansus, um, this is uh, I, I've seen this rune associated with magic and Odin, but also communication and intelligence and wisdom and understanding and spells. That kind of thing. It's a very mental rune. Uh, ride, ride ho, ride ho. Uh, my pronunciation is going to be wild. And there's different, there's different pronunciation uh, names for these things. They vary slightly depending on the time period. So I'm going to try my best. Anyways, ride ho represents a wagon. It symbolizes travel, rhythm, spontaneity, and decisions and choices and movement and all that stuff. Kenaz is next. It's a torch. It's vision, creativity, inspiration. You can think of this as like an inner light, um, uh, the inner light. That's a good way to put it. And vitality, too, I guess would be another one. Gebo or Gifu, it represents the gift. It symbolizes balance, exchange, partnerships, generosity, and relationships. And gift giving was critical uh, to the society when these things were in their heyday. It was a very, very big part of it. Uh, Wunyo, so this is the rune of joy. It represents pleasure, comfort, harmony, prosperity, reward, success, all the fun things in life that you want. So it's a good one to have come up in your readings. Hagalaz, or um, I actually I don't remember any other names for this. Hagal, I guess. Uh, it represents hail. It symbolizes really the dangerous parts of nature, things that break, uh, break people. So <laughs> it's a hailstorm. It symbolizes nature's wrath, tests, an obstacle, destructive thing that you have to overcome. It's kind of a, kind of a hard ass rune. Um, Naudis or Nalthis, it represents need, and this represents absolute need, like not a want, but a need. I need this or I'm going to die rune. Um, and so that represents, I have in my list, it says restriction, conflict, willpower, endurance, and self-reliance, which I think is a good recap. 
Next rune, number 11 is Issa, which is ice. It represents clarity, stasis, so things frozen, challenges, introspection, watching and waiting. So it's things are frozen. Things are not moving when Issa comes up. Yara, on the other hand, represents the year. It represents cycles, completion, changes, harvests, getting rewards. It's uh, the end of a cycle, the start of a new thing. So it's a very flowing rune. Uh, Ihuaz is a yew tree, so it represents uh, balance, enlightenment, death, and the world tree. It's an interesting rune. Um, I think that's probably all I'll say there. I got to keep moving. Perthro, it represents a dice cup. So it's uh, fate, chance, mysteries. It's kind of a, it's uh, it's kind of a strange rune because if you're looking for answers and you get it's a mystery it's not very not very helpful even though sometimes it is but it does it can denote there's an element of chance uh you don't have total control over what you're doing when pertho comes up algis as an elk it symbolizes protection defense instinct group effort and guardianship from my notes um yeah it also is a connection with the gods and higher powers it's kind of a higher protective force which I don't have listed here, but I did pull it out of my brain, so I'm very pleased with myself for doing that. Uh, Sawilo represents the sun. So this is the outer light, the light of the world. It represents health, honor, resources, victory, wholeness, and cleansing. So that's a, usually a very positive rune. Uh, Tiwas, it represents the god Tyr. It symbolizes masculinity, justice, leadership, logic, and battle. So, you know, uh, it's a very masculine rune. Um, and it's a very it's a rune, I would say, of civilization. It's a very orderly rune. Uh, Burkana is next. It's the birch tree. It symbolizes, on the other hand, complementary to Tyr, uh, Tiwaz, excuse me, femininity, fertility, healing, regeneration, and birth. So we have this nice masculine feminine balance right here between those two runes. Next up is Ewas. It represents a horse. It means transportation movement progress but more importantly a kind of uh kind of movement through partnership idea uh movement through combining your energies with the energies of nature and uh being transported by that next is manas so it represents humanity so it represents individuals friendship society cooperation and help so basically anything dealing with people is going to fall under manas, which you can probably tell is close to the word man. Um, that's enough said about that. Lagus represents water. It symbolizes intuition, emotions, flow, dreams, hopes and fears. Anything kind of feely, any feelings is under Lagus. Anything psychic too, anything dream-wise or otherworldly probably would be under Lagus. Next is Ingus represents a seed uh, so it symbolizes goals growth change common sense and the home and speaking of the home the next rune is othala which is uh, ancestry possessions heritage uh, long lasting generational wealth in some cases experiences that are passed down and the final 24th rune is dagas which represents the dawn the dawn or the day uh, it symbolizes awakening, certainty, illumination, completion, hope, everything you would associate with the dawning of a new day. And that is the 24 runes of the Elder Futhark and their brief, brief, brief meanings. And now let's get into the brief usage of this oracle. So how do you actually use the rune? The key thing here is layouts. It's a lot like the tarot. You're going to have a kind of way to put them on the table. And then each rune that's in a position will inform you as to what's happening in that position. Uh, most people put their runes in a bag. They're generally going to be on little tiles made out of wood or bone or stone. They're almost always natural elements. And uh, you put them in the bag, shake your bag up, you pull some runes out, you put them in the places that uh, your layout dictates. Usually people are going to throw them onto the table because that will generate a certain directionality so it can turn the rune upside down or sideways or leaning one way or the other and then they'll kind of you know put it in the position in their layout in that same uh, uh, orientation that it came out of the after the throw uh, so anyways once you get all your runes on the table then you can start reading them uh, it's very simple to get started 
And today, specifically for this show, we're going to be focused on the two rune layout. And generally, rune one is thought to be that which is, and rune two is going to be that which it becomes. Okay, so it's a bit, bit like now and later, or, you know, present, future. That's what we're going to do. So let's get into it in the next section. See you there. All right, guys, welcome to the question segment. Uh, if you would ever like one of your questions to be posed to the Oracle on an episode of Castamancy, send it over to Castamancer at Castamancy.com, or you can find me on Facebook at uh, just Castamancy, I think, and you can send me a question there. That is good. I will I actually would appreciate it. I would look forward to your questions. It's a lot of fun to answer other people's questions <laughs> instead of my own, so... Speaking of my own questions, here's the ones that I had for the show. I do like to ask really bizarre questions. And you know what? I think I totally forgot to ask a verifiable question for this show. So we're going to let it slide. Uh, here's the crazy ones. And I made it a little hard on myself because I asked a lot of yes or no questions, which I don't think the runes are particularly well suited for. You can do it, but um, it can be difficult. So here we are. The first question we have is, are we living before or after Ragnarok? And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what Ragnarok is, it's basically the apocalypse story of the Nordic myths. All the gods get into a fight with all the giants and everything gets completely destroyed. It's the end of the world, except for like one god, Baldur, and two people. Uh, uh, Ash and Elm, I think their names translate to. And that's it. So has this apocalypse already happened? Are we living in the Nordic post-apocalypse in the new world? Or are we still living in pre-Ragnarok times? So when we did this reading, we had the runes Wunyo and Algis come up. Uh, and Wunyo was reversed. So when Wunyo is reversed, remember it's the rune of joy and happiness. You can invert all those meanings. So it's lost happiness, catastrophe being close at hand disharmony panic unity is gone it's a time of darkness it's really really garbage it's not fun and then we have the rune augies after that which is again protection connection with the gods protecting others it can be thought of as a kind of shield it's a way to connect with higher powers so if we take this uh as this leads to this kind of thing which is what this layout does it's a catastrophe leading to a kind of connection to the gods. Uh, the chaos Wunyo inverted was in the past, and now we have a reconnection with the gods. So just based on this very deep two-rune reading, we are living in post-Ragnarok times. <laughs> the apocalypse has already happened. And I got to say, I'm not sure the world is... Uh, that much better for it <laughs> there it is so yeah it's uh you know we went over the story a little bit so it's uh it would suggest also that the stories and sagas are even longer and longer ago all of those myths about the gods and humanity that's all pre-apocalypse and now we're living in uncharted territories really an interesting interpretation i don't of course who knows but um it's a fun it's a fun thing to think about has the apocalypse already happened? And according to the runes, the answer is yes. Let's go on to our next question. It's, are giants real? Um, if you are into any alternative history at all, you may have come across the concept that remains of giant humans or humanoids have been found, uh, buried. And if you go really deep, you find that uh, there may be some kind of black ops division of the Smithsonian Museum that uh, removes all of these uh, skeletons before they can be um, cataloged in any meaningful way. That's the story about giants and their bodies anyways. Uh, who knows what's, who knows? But I will say uh, to that point that they have found basically hobbit skeletons. It's Homo florensius, I think. It's in New Zealand, I think. 
Uh, so hobbits are confirmed, so why not giants? Anyways, we're going to get into this. The runes that came up were Algis, which is reversed, and Anses. So we have Algis reversed, which, again, if you remember from my lovely breakdown of the runes, uh, Algis is the rune of protection, but it's flipped here, so there's no protection. There's an openness to attack. You're alone, vulnerable, or even dead, and you're at least open to death. Uh, so it's not really a good... Not really a good rune for the for the giants here. And then Ansus is, again, messages and intelligence, communication, magic. So, are giants real? We have uh, no protection leading to some kind of communication. The way I read this was basically uh, in the past there was no protection. So, it seems if giants were real, they were open to some kind of attack and probably destroyed. Which makes sense because we don't really see a lot of giants running around right now but we do sometimes allegedly find their bodies so uh in the in the past the giants lost their protection whatever kept them going and then in the present we have magic and messages and mythologies and stories and communications so there's nothing more than myths about them now uh so according to the runes yes giants were real but they got totally wiped out and now they're just stories uh, and what's interesting with this uh, reading here is that uh, Ansus is the rune that's associated with Odin. And Odin spent a lot of time fighting giants. So there's a lack of protection. And then Odin on the scene may be striking the death blow. And again, if we go back to the Apocalypse reading, the Ragnarok reading, we're post uh, Ragnarok according to the runes. So there were giants. Ragnarok happened. Odin probably killed a lot of them. They're gone now. So, rune readings, 100% uh, accuracy so far. I think we're, <laughs> we're doing pretty good. Anyway, let's get into the last goofy question. How can you defend yourself against an elf attack? So, again, if you're familiar at all with Nordic lore, elves are kind of a nature spirit. And in Iceland specifically, they take the elves uh, to a degree very seriously to the point where they will build roads around rocks that elves are said to live in or at least they did in the past um and i think probably many people in the country still would believe in uh, elves and the like and sometimes people and elves get into a little trouble with each other so if you should be wandering in elf country and offend the forest people how can you defend yourself so the answer was nowadays and bracano and now these, remember, is a need. It is an absolute want for something critical. You are going to die if you don't get it. It's critical for your survival. And then Bracano, which is love, birth, fertility, mothers, spring, all the, all the growing stuff, all the nurturing stuff. Uh, so we have the need for something and then growth. But that's kind of, it's kind of weird. I, it's, this is a tough reading. Now these is very obvious you have a need for protection right you have you're in trouble you're being attacked by elves there's a need there's a very serious need and i love when the runes and any divination system are so on the point but at the same time it's like yes i know that already i think it's not very it's not very helpful but it is interesting when it, when they so are on the nose like that uh so it's it, anyways with this it's a need leading to a growth or a love or a renewal or a need for those things so if elves attack you, just call your mom. Everything's going to be all right. Um, but probably more seriously, love is the answer, <laughs> which is gross. I hate saying that. Uh, and I don't think that's the case either. I, I think really what's happening here is that uh, the idea is to ignore the attack. There's there's a need. and then But if you just focus on, oh my goodness. You know how I said there's going to be any background noises? Hold on. I don't know if you could hear that, but my dehumidifier kicked on because I forgot that I left it running. <sighs> There's a need for a quieter studio, is what there is. So anyways, yeah, it's just kind of ignore the attack. That's my take. Um, the more you focus on uh, new growth and moving beyond it and getting out of there and starting over, um, the better off you'll be, I think, with a lot of these things. The more you focus on negativity and the attack, in this case, the more power you might give it. So... Let's go ahead and turn it around. And also, 
in terms of like rune magic, carrying Bracano might be advised here as uh, as a ward against elven magic. But anyways, good luck. Don't piss off elves. That's it. We do have one listener question this time. Uh, so let's get into it. It's how will travel planning go? So we had two runes, as we have been doing. We had Yera and Wunyo come up, and Yera is the rune of change and cycles and time and uh, tuning into the environment and all those things. And Wunyo is the rune of happiness and joy and connections with people and good times. So changes and cycles lead to joy. So, you know, it's great. Looks like everything's good. The planning is going to go very splendidly fun and easy and uh, everything gained from previous trips, all that travel expertise will come in handy here. Um, and that's great. So the question specifically was about travel planning and not about any trip itself. So excuse me while I belch into my microphone as quietly as I can. The, tra the trip, the travel, the planning is going to be fun, but the trip, who knows? Uh, hopefully that will go well too. That is it for this section. That's all the questions I have. I forgot to do a real question that we can verify last time. Who cares? Let's have some fun and get into the summary of the runes. All right, so the runes. Do we like them or not? And why do we like them or don't? Here we go. Here's the categories that we're going to review these things by. We're going to break them down. Excuse me, my voice is uh, prepubescent today. Uh, ease of use. Uh, they're very simple. They're very simple. They're just 24 tiles. You select the layout, you pick some runes, and you put them in the layout, and that's it. The tricky part is, of course, reading them and getting information out of them, but actually manipulating the oracle and performing the technique so simple there's not much to it learning curve uh so you could probably start off with the runes fairly easily there's a, there's a bit to learn but if you have a good guidebook you can kind of take your time and look things up in the book the meanings of the runes which you will that's where you're going to mostly be concerned with you're going to want to know the meanings of the 24 runes in and out eventually if you want to get uh, really good with this and um and then practice with the interactions, how one might interact with another rune. And you'll also want to read runes, probably. You'll want to think about their meanings when they are reversed. It's also called Merkstave, Merkstav, whatever. It's called Merkstave something. So it means reversed. Uh, most, most rune readers will consider reversed runes. Some don't, but most will. So you will want to know what the inversion of uh, Bracano is, for example, or Lagos, um, uh, what they mean. And usually it just means like a blockage or a complete inversion of the meaning. So it's pretty, fairly simple if you know the original meaning. Clarity of answers. The runes are usually pretty straightforward in the answers they give you. Uh, it's, it's, I find it's mostly due with their, with their meanings themselves. They're very archetypical. Uh, so they're very big, uh, easily graspable ideas. Graspable? Mm -hmm. um, and you can easily apply them to whatever your question is. Uh, but sometimes, like we had happen, they're a little too direct or simple, I think. Uh, it's like when we asked about what to do when you get attacked by elves and we had need come up. It's like, yeah, there's a need for protection. We get it. So sometimes that will happen. Um, but overall, they're very, cl they're, they're very clear. Intuitive application. How much of an intuition do you need to read the runes? bring your intuition you're going to need it for sure so uh the runes themselves their meanings are kind of locked down and the layouts are also kind of locked down and the relationships maybe but you will need to still take those meanings and apply them to your question which is not always easy so you will need to bring it's comparable to and it's comparable to most you know cartomantic methods um the same same idea you're going to pull a symbol that symbol has a meaning now you have to apply it to your situation it's not it's not crazy you know you're not going to be up all night doing it but you will need to think it's not as simple as some oracles for sure that just give you the answer depth uh, all right at a surface level 
the runes are quite simple. They have their meanings, and that's that. But if you want to go deep, you can go very, 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 very deep. Uh, and I, I mean crazy. I'm not going to get into it, but people have all, probably almost lost their minds looking for, you know, teasing out more and more meaning and more and more connections. And what does this mean? And is this uh, a seed rune? Which rune contains all the runes? What is this? People go nuts. You can go deep into the history and the magic and the magical history, or you can go in your own personal practice and pull out whatever you want. So if you are bored and you want something to do, I would recommend the runes. There's uh, there's a great range. Um, there's a great range for people who are casually interested. You can get started quite easily and do a reading. Um, then there, are, you know, if someone wants to be a rune master, you can do that too. So there's a there's a good range of interest for everybody. I think portability. It's great. It's there's no books. There's no paper. There's no cards. It's just a little bag of runes. And most people have small stones or small pieces of wood, so they don't take up a lot of room. You could probably fit them in your pocket or you simply, you know, in a bag or whatever, no problem. Um, they're very easy to bring almost anywhere. Very simple to draw. You could just pull one rune out whenever you have a, something you want to think about. Um, and it's really cool. They have a, they have a, well, we'll get into that, but um, they're very easy to carry. So the aesthetic or the gestalt of the runes, they're very cool. They have a wonderful feeling to them. Uh, they're so tied into old mythology that they have a really kind of fun, but uh, well, I don't want to say fun. They have a <laughs> they have a fun, serious vibe, um, and they're really they're really powerful in the old stories. And to a lot of practicing uh, people who use them for magic, they also believe they're quite powerful. So I mean, even the gods were bound by fate, and the fates would carve the fates of all things into the world tree using runes. So I understand it. Anyways, they're important. They have a cool history to them. They are magical uh, symbols. They look mysterious. I'm just going to punch my microphone. Excuse me. They, uh, they're really neat. So, uh, and what did I want to say? Yes, they have, when you're reading the runes, you know, they have the old kind of almost shamanistic vibe. They have a very primal rawness to them where it's not so refined uh, as the image of a tarot reader in a coffee shop or something. This is, you're going to go to an old cowskin tent and somebody's going to throw you know bones with mysterious symbols around that kind of vibe that's what i like about the runes overall chef's kiss uh what do they seem to be well suited for in terms of readings generally it's going to be like bigger life questions um you know, what should i do where's my heart at what am i missing how does someone feel about this health uh questions spiritual issues of course, you can use them for any question you want. I think uh, I've hopefully at least sort of demonstrated that with my ridiculous questions. Um, so you really can use them. I suppose you could use them for whatever, like, you know, the usual, where did I leave my keys? Or where are my glasses? Um, and maybe you'll get the rune that tells you they're already on your head. I don't know, something like that. Uh, another thing with the runes is uh, I see a lot of usage is towards the future or foresight. That seems to be uh, a, a long-standing association with these things, and it's used in the myths as well. So that is it for the review section. We are going to go into uh, the review section for the last oracle we used, which was the I Ching. I will see you there. All right, last time on the show, we consulted the I Ching. Uh, so we have a short section this time. I just have one verifiable question from last time. And we asked the I Ching, where is Bitcoin going from here? Being at the time when we asked. And the I Ching basically said that Bitcoin is going to die. It's going to go to zero. It's a miserable uh, outlook. And so I did look it up from the time I asked the question till now, which when this show comes out, uh, Price hasn't really moved that much, but I will say that Bitcoin was below the last main support level. So that means it's going to have a tough time getting back above it. It's not looking good. It's got a long way back down to like 10,000 or something. Uh, who knows where it's going to go? I Ching was pessimistic. I'm pessimistic as a general rule, um, but in particular in this case. 
So it's something to watch out for. I'm kind of excited to see how this one pans out. Guys, that's it for the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope it was an interesting episode. I was a bit rushed today, so, you know, whatever. I promise to do better next time. Uh, next time on the show, we're going to explore dice divination. We're going to do a simple method and ask very silly questions. And uh, we'll see what we come up with. If you'd like to get your questions answered on the next show, submit them to castamancer at castamancy.com or on Facebook under Castamancy. And please send me your questions. I would love to answer them for you as best I can. Uh, make sure you subscribe and whatever else you do with podcasts. I think you can rate them somehow. So obviously give us, uh, you know, the maximum rating. Uh, thank you so much for listening, Castamancers. I will see you in the future.